again and welcome to another edition of Southern Country. Hi, I'm Herb Suds and welcome to the show, my friends. Today I'm very lucky to have Skaggs family recording artist, Cherry Holmes. How you doing? I'm doing great. great. Mm -hmm. Doing real fine. Uh, let's introduce who makes up Cherry Holmes. Starting well, here. Start with me. I'm uh, Jerry. They call me Pop. Okay. I'm Sandy Lee. I'm Mom. I'm Sia. I'm Skip. I'm BJ. I'm Molly. Okay, welcome to the show, everybody. Tell you what we're going to do. Let's start with you and start with you, what would you do as far as the show is concerned? What's Pop do? What's your... Well, I'm sort of the ramrod. I play the bass and I keep the stage... I, I manage the stage when we're on stage. Instrument-wise? I play bass. Okay. Mom? I play uh, mandolin and claw hammer banjo and um, sing. Uh, everybody sings in the group. I do that, pick. And, and what else do you do as far as um, background? Backstage work, too. Backstage work, I choreograph a lot of the dance routines sure. we do. We do Irish step dancing and clogging, and I uh, put together a lot of that. And um, then I'm the booking agent and homeschool okay. teacher. Okay. So. See ya. Uh, I play the banjo and I help with some of the publicity and help keep everybody fed and everything <laughs> <laughs> put together. That's right. Okay. I'm, I'm the guitar player and mandolin player and roadie, so to speak. Okay. BJ? I'm BJ and I uh, play the fiddle and uh, count CDs at the end of a show. <laughs> <laughs> and I also set up sound equipment before and uh, tear it down afterwards. Okay. I'm Molly and I play the fiddle and also I, uh, I help make sure everything's set up at the product table and I do inventory and I help do uh, arrange some of the songs. Wow, very good. Everybody got their jobs on and off the stage. Right. All right, let's talk about the, the, the album coming out, that CD coming out in September called Cherry Homes, first album for Skaggs family. Talk to me about yeah, it. We're really excited about it. We just finished it about a month ago as far as uh, getting all the mix down, done, the mastering done, the pho photography all done, and it's coming out September the 27th. Yep. And uh, I think it's going to be pretty good. It's pretty packed in there. It's got about 15 cuts. Something like 47, 48 minutes worth of music on there. It has hardcore bluegrass. It has a little touch of country. Okay. There's a little bit of Celtic on there. And uh, quite a variety. There's nine original songs out of the bunch that were written by everybody in the group. And uh, Skaggs is excited about it. We're excited about it. What's the difference between this one and your other three, Bluegrass Vagabond, Dress for Success, and and uh, still a little rough around the edge. What's the improvements on this or difference that the people well, are going to see when they buy it? What you'll see or what you'll hear is uh, on uh, the very first one, which was still a little rough around the edges, that's, yeah. that term is descriptive of the, <laughs> of the record. Okay. We, we recorded that ourselves at home. Okay. And, uh, and it's not bad. And then we moved on up to Dress for Success, which yeah. we did in the studio over two days. Oh, wow. It was just sort of a, we, we just played everything and sang everything, and it was done. And then we went to Bluegrass Vagabonds, which we did in Nashville. It was produced by Darren Vincent, Rhonda's brother. Yeah, no. We used Nashville studios and, and sound and everything. And, and then this one we recorded at Skaggs. And what you'll see, the difference is, is the same thing you see when you watch your kids grow up physically. Wow. You figure the first one came out about four years ago, so everybody here was four years younger. Yeah. And their abilities were whatever they were at the time. So what you'll see in the succession of records is you see them grow in their proficiency and grow and grow until now they're every bit as good as any professional out there. Wow. So I think that the people that buy it will be really pleased with it. Nothing wrong with that. You guys were talking about four years ago. You guys have only been together since, what, 1999 as a, as a singing group. Sandy? Yes. Um, we actually never intended to have a professional music group. We uh, always enjoyed music, and Jerry and I played in church and uh, put together a lot of music. The, some of the older kids, we had two older children who would sing in church with us. I mostly played piano and Jerry played electric bass. And then back in 1999, March of 99, we lost our oldest daughter. Right. She died of uh, some uh, condition, a heart mm -hmm. condition, mm -hmm. and she's 20 years old. And about a month later, we went to a bluegrass festival just to break the routine mm -hmm. and to get out of the house, get out from under the cloud. And 
uh, it changed our whole lives. On wow. the way back home, uh, Jerry said, let's start a bluegrass group with the kids. That would be really great because they could play at any level. Right. Bluegrass is a music that people can get involved in, even if they only know one or two chords. Right. And we thought, well, that would be really great because the young ones hadn't really played. They hadn't played with us. And Sia was strumming around on the guitar playing some church songs. Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, let's pick out some instruments. Wow. I'll uh, work with them during the day for one of their music classes because mm -hmm. I homeschool them. And then at night yep. when their dad came home, we would jam, have our family jam. We didn't have uh, the TV mm -hmm. on or no computers or anything like that. And we did it for fun, and it just blossomed into well, something thanks. we never even dreamed. You know, nobody, I think, ever dreamed of what, what happened to all you guys in no. the last five <laughs> years. I don't think you guys, I, don't, I never heard of it, you know. Why you couldn't get this, why'd you pick bluegrass as a, as a genre of music to bring everybody into instead of another genre? I think because at the time when we were introduced to bluegrass it was very uplifting and that's what we needed at the time. We were going through the, the loss and it, the music gets inside of you and just brings you up. We've had comments from people who've seen our shows that they had been going through this real trial or some sort of bad thing in life but after coming to one of our shows they just felt they had thrown all the burdens off. Wow. And it's a very social music. The it people is. who get involved in bluegrass are usually first class. They're just mm -hmm. good down home people. They want a wholesome uh, atmosphere sure. for the most part. The kids, it's really good for families, the kids to be involved. And it's a lot of fun. People will pick on the stage and then they'll go out into the campgrounds and then they'll just Without pick on, on, you know, and they help people along. It was just very social, happy <laughs> music. Now, I just want to make mention, everybody here travels in the bus and you guys are on the road 300 days a year? 200 days a year? Yeah, about 300. 300. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how many people, I asked this question before the show, how many groups that you know are doing what you're doing today? Is this, this is pretty unusual what you're doing. Am I correct in saying that, Jerry? Yeah, there's, there are a few uh, family groups out there that have a bus and travel around, and uh, most notable as far as history goes, is the Lewis family. That's true. They've been doing it for 52 years. Been out of years. And uh, and then there's the Isaacs who are bluegrass gospel. Uh, they've been doing it since the kids were small. Right. Uh, at, at this present time, there I don't think there is another family out there that's doing it on the level that we're doing it. Yeah, you put. They're, they're, uh, they go around and play mostly at smaller places and. Mm. Uh, and uh, churches and things like that, but mm -hmm. I think we're the only family group that's actually up in the professional ranks wow. in bluegrass. See, you picked up and you play guitar. I, I did. I started. Yep. <laughs> I started on guitar originally, well, and then about four and a half years ago, I switched to banjo. Why? Because my dad made me. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Why'd you make her switch to banjo? Well, you know, you can't have a bluegrass band without a band. Gotta right? have it. Gotta have and, it. Uh, there you go. I picked her because I thought that she could do it, and she's proved that she could do it. She was named Banjo Player of the Year. I heard that. At Spigna this last year, uh, so I, I guess I guessed you, right. You were a good choice on that one, huh? Yeah. How long have you been playing the guitar before you were on the banjo? Um, I think I started playing guitar when I was around 12. Okay. But definitely found banjo was what I was best suited for, and my brother has really done more than I'd ever do on it, so it yep. really was a good switch. You're yes, on, Skip. What are you on now? I'm on guitar. Okay. And I played mandolin previously. Okay. Uh, when I when we started back in 99. How old How old were you when you start, picked up your first instrument? Uh, nine years old. Nine years old? Nine years. Wow. Yes. Wow. And you're proficient on it now. And it's, you never took a lesson. Anybody, you guys never took lessons? No. You just, amazing. Amazing. BJ, how old were you when you picked up your first instrument? I was 11 years old at the time. Uh, me and Molly both started at the same time. She was six. Right. right? Seven. Seven. She was seven, and I was 11, and we both started at the same time six years ago. Molly, how old were you when you picked up your first instrument? Seven. Seven? Yeah. And your instrument is, you still stay playing the same instrument? Yeah, I'm still playing the And same. you're a songwriter. I, I was talking to Ron and Vincent, and she was telling me about you. Yep, I, I write songs. Some of the songs, anyways. See, you writes most of them, but I try and put all my oomph into one song to make it real good. <laughs> Where do you get your ideas from, Molly? Uh, really nothing, I guess. <laughs> I have no experience, but uh, uh, I just sort of think, for, for me, I don't write as 
I don't write from like a story or somebody told me anything. I just sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write a song, and I I write a song. So you normally let normally I ask the artist when I when I interview them, you have to you have to live it to write it to perform it. Obviously, Molly. <laughs> it's true. You know, which is true. A lot of artists have to live it to write it to perform it. Mm -hmm. But Molly is... I just write it and right, perform she it. Right, she just writes it and she performs it. Yeah. <laughs> Do all the songs you guys write go over well with the audiences? Do you ever have a dud that you wrote that the audience didn't really like in any way? No, I don't, no? I don't think we ever really had any duds. I mean, there's a few of them that we wrote and, and after we performed them for a while, we felt like we had something better to offer, so we rotated out. You had, did you? There has been, you know, every once in a while, you'll get an individual complaint, maybe, about something they didn't like about a song or what should have happened with the song. But as far as uh, whole goes, I don't think we've ever had a bad song. You never had to just tweak it and improve it. We're very, very picky, so and, we're, and we try to be honest with each other, sure. so if one of us writes a song and we say, oh, I got this new song, and we play it for the band, the rest of us, if it's not good, you know, we're pretty honest with each right. other. Well, you know, I really yeah. don't think that's going to work, okay. and so we try to, to get past that. What? As, as a matter of fact, we had this the other day. We, we have to do a lot of our organizing of material on the road, like sure. in a campground, a yeah, KOA, yeah. or something like that, since we're always traveling, and we were at a KOA just about a week and a half ago, and we thought, well, let's get together and work on some new things that we haven't gotten to do. And see if she comes to make her offering, and she's playing this song. And then the next thing I know, two of them are singing the lyrics to someone else's song to this yeah, song. Okay. And they said, I think we have a problem here. I think this is someone else's song. <laughs> so, so sometimes things like that come up. When, when you write your songs, have you ever pitched any songs to any other artists? Any of your songs that have been recorded by other artists? Uh, so far, Molly. Molly, uh, okay, Molly's uh, with Rhonda Vincent. Okay, Frankie. Uh, Frankie, about yeah. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Most of the material that we end up putting our energies into ends up something that uh, is meant for an addition to our group. Okay. And you know, we end up writing songs. The big reason why we write songs is so that we can write new material, put new material into our set, and rotate some of the older stuff right. uh, out, or just as an addition, because. We play, we probably have a total of uh, four or five sets of non-repeated music that we can play, 45-minute sets that we can play non-repeated music just so that, you know, crowds don't come back this next day and I say, know. well, we already heard that song. That's a good idea. Right. So That's a good idea. We don't pitch a lot of our songs to other artists right. for that specific reason because we need songs. Of all those, those, of those four sets that you can rotate around, how many are originals, how many are cover songs you mix up in there? Uh, Percentage-wise, there's probably a very, very good percentage of the songs that we actually wrote. Uh, I'd say. Home. We've written a lot of songs. Um, most of the songs that we do perform that we have not written are ones that are not performed by many groups. Right. Okay. So you won't hear a lot of groups play the songs that we play. Okay. Well, let's talk about your stage show. High-powered instrumentals at warp speed. Now, what does W A R P speed mean? I read that someplace. Well. <laughs> I tell you what, when you've got mostly teenagers and young people playing, they can play fast. And yeah. uh, one of the major culprits is BJ down there, uh -oh. who's a, a fiddler that plays like his hands are on fire. There you go. And, uh, and so we've been astonished at times when people have recorded what we played and realizing just how fast it is. Wow. But if you remember uh, a group from some time back called the Johnson Mountain Boys. Yeah, I know them well. Uh, they've always been kind of inspiring to us yeah. by the sheer energy that they exude off the stage. They sure do. And I don't know if there's anybody around who can play the banjo as fast as Tom Adams except for maybe little Roy Lewis. Yeah, he's good. And uh, But every note is articulated, and that's what we try to do. We don't just try to play things fast. We want them... We want the notes to be articulated right. well, and and that would be the warp speed. It's just some nope. of the stuff is just really pretty cranked up. You have the audience on a roller coaster ride, the highs and the lows, the speed and excitement. Is that a true statement? Yes, uh, we from the very beginning we fashioned our shows to uh, give the audience an emotional experience, and that is to grab them and then to build them up bring them down, build them up, and make them sit on the edge of their seat. And we thought of that when we first started 
taking our performing seriously because when we wanted to to get on the stage, we wanted to make sure the audience didn't choose our set to no. go get the corn dog. Oh, yeah. And so since That's we true. started out in the audience, we tried to ask our own selves, well, what would cause us to sit and watch a band and what would cause us to look at our watch after the third song and say, I think I'm going to get up. And I think to me personally, the one person that really stood out in my mind was Dole Lawson. The first oh, yeah. time we You're saw good. him, you were glued to mm -hmm. everything he was going to mm -hmm. do. It mm -hmm. was funny. But he was great. The vocals were great. You never knew what was happening, and you couldn't wait till the next show. And Rhonda Vincent was another one. We saw oh, Rhonda yeah. perform, and uh, you know, Jerry was saying, "There's just something. I don't even know what it is. There's something she does that's just powerful. Just she's just a powerful performer." So we started looking at that and trying right. to say, "Well, how can we do that?" Because so many bands would have empty chairs in front of them. Dancing, you guys dance on stage. Mm -hmm. That's also All part of, of the us. energy level. All uh, there's five of us. Pop missed the dance lessons because oh. he was working when I gave him. Okay. But uh, from the time River Dance came out years ago, yeah, uh, I remember was that. really fascinated with it, and we started uh, Irish step dancing. I taught yeah. him how to Irish step wow. dance a few years ago. When we started the band, we were in a desperate need for songs. Right. We got a job that was running about six hours a day. It was our first job. Uh, six hours on a Saturday with just about a 10 or 15 minute break and we only knew about nine songs when we got hired okay. we were in a dead panic I'll for bet. music but we could all dance oh, so okay. we made all these different configurations of dance routines right. with one person or two or five mm -hmm. and someone else would play something and we found the audience really liked it so that's a part of our show in some form is uh, somebody will usually do something you guys ran into Rhonda Vince and a good friend of mine has been on here how'd you meet her anybody you wanted Molly why don't you talk about Molly her? Um, actually, uh, we were playing in California at a bluegrass festival, and uh, Rhonda Vincent, that, that's the first time we actually saw her perform, and uh, uh, we were sort of, I was sort of walking around, and Mom came running back and said, you should come back, uh, Hunter Berry, her fiddle player, he's playing, and uh, BJ's over there, you should get your fiddle out, so we went over there and played, and Hunter Berry was really impressed with our fiddling, so Hunter sort of said something, uh, something to Rhonda, and I sort of met her, but she was busy at that time. And then we started seeing her. We saw her at her uh, father's festival, mm -hmm. and we saw her in Branson. We were nice. playing on different stages, so we'd go watch her, and she'd come watch us. And a friend of mine, he, uh, he'd bring her over during one of our sets, and uh, I was playing my song Frankie Bell. Yep. And after the show, she'd come up and asked me to play it about four or five times so she could listen to it. And then... Uh, a week later at IBMA, uh, we went over there and she asked if I would come and record it with her. So mm -hmm. Very good. She's a great person. Mm -hmm. The whole family is great. Yeah, they are. I wanna, we're going to close up here, but talk to me about your, your bluegrass festival down in uh, LaGrange, Georgia. That you'd start up a bluegrass festival, guys, didn't you? Yes. Uh, there's a, a man by the name of Rick Torrance that has yeah. a Hoofers Gospel Barn, it's called, and he has a few festivals every year. We went down to play on James... James King's Festival in October a couple of years ago, and uh, when we got done, not too long after that, Rick approached us with uh, hosting a festival yep. down there. So it's the third weekend in October at Hoofers Gospel Barn in LaGrange, Georgia, mm -hmm. and uh, our festival is called the Best in Tradition. Yep. And so we have traditional groups. We'll have uh, Paul Williams right. come down, and we'll have, okay. uh, well now it's Dan Paisley, Yep. and Southern Grass so because uh, Bob passed away. Mm -hmm. We got J.D. Crow and uh, who else David we got? Peterson. Yeah, we're going to have David yeah, Peterson in 1946. Mm -hmm. I think the Bluegrass Brothers are going to mm -hmm. be down good. there. Yeah, that's good. And uh, just real good, solid, traditional group from around the east. And uh, we don't invite anybody that's in, in the area to come to there it you because go. it's a great park. They got great food and, uh, and it's indoors and just a real nice time. Uh, you guys got a lot of awards, considering you're only five years in the business here. You were on the opera, you played at the Ryman, you're Emerging Artist of the Year Award from the IBMA, and I don't even, there's a bunch of them here, you know, but we're running out of time. Website, who wants to talk about the website before we give it on the air? Oh, uh, cherryholmes.net. There you go. Uh, it's easy, e easy one. The, our schedule is always updated on there. There's stories, there are pictures, uh, background on how we got started. Uh, a, you can order CDs, t-shirts, and all of that off the website. It's right. a great website, cherryholmes.net. 
I want to thank everybody for being on the show. Appreciate you taking thank time you. to visit me here in Sudden Country. We appreciate it. Continued success with your careers, and we look forward to seeing you on the stage, and uh, see you next time you're in New Jersey. Okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.